We're taking a break from our study in the book of Hebrews, and we'll be considering a different texts from various genres of Scripture. And so we begin uh, with the law of God. We begin with the book of Deuteronomy. And so the focus of our study this morning will be verses 10 to 25. So uh, let's, let's uh, prepare our hearts. Let's hear the reading of God's Word. Moses says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, as you tested him at Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you, and that you may go in and take possession of the good land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers by thrusting out all your enemies from before you, as the Lord has promised. When your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and grievous, against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there, that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do this commandment before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, a good story is hard to resist. And the reason a good story is hard to resist is because a good story brings us in and and holds our attention. In fact, stories are so powerful that if a story can capture our imagination, it can control our entire lives. That's one of the reasons why nations and empires and social movements work so hard and, and rely so hard on, on the telling and, and retelling of stories. And that's why in our current cultural moment, people, uh, news organizations, and political parties uh, work so hard, as the saying goes, to control the narrative. It's common knowledge that the story of a, of a nation's origin can shape that nation's sense of, of identity and destiny. That's For example, what Virgil's epic poem, The Aeneid, did for the Romans under Caesar Augustus. It it provided the people a sense of identity and destiny. And so the importance of stories uh, raises a question for us today, and it's the question that I want us to consider, and that is, what story has captured your heart and your imagination? What is the fundamental narrative that, that shapes and forms your sense of identity and destiny? In other words, when you roll out of bed in the morning and your feet hit the floor, what story do you tell yourself about yourself? We need to give thought to this because our moral imagination does have a, a certain shape to it, whether we realize it or not. And it's, that moral imagination is, is, is influenced by the story we tell ourselves. So stories matter. But we also know that history matters. And it's those two components that come together in the passage that we just read. 
If you're not familiar with the book of Deuteronomy, you should know that it basically consists of a series of sermons that Moses preached to the people of Israel as he, Moses, was passing off the scene and the people were getting ready to go in to possess the land, to enter the promised land. And in verse 23 of Deuteronomy 6, you find there uh, the centerpiece of not just this sermon, but all of the sermons in the book of Deuteronomy. And that is that he brought us out to bring us in. I think we might rightly call that the gospel according to Moses. And that's how he summarizes the redemption of the people of Israel. He brought us out to bring us in. And so as the people are getting ready to go into the land, he, he wants them to know that they are a people who have been purchased by God. And of course, when we set that truth within the context of the entirety of Scripture, we know, as we've been seeing in the book of Deuteronomy, that the redemption of the people of Israel foreshadows and prefigures the greatest redemption story of all time, the redemption of our Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. And so if Deuteronomy 6.23 is the centerpiece of this sermon, I think we can say that the centerpiece of the gospel, that is to say a verse in the Bible that summarizes it and encapsulates the story of the gospel so well is right there on the top of your take home, Colossians 1.13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. And so to put it in a sentence for us today, we're going to see that our God freed us from the bondage of sin to bring us into the kingdom of his beloved son. And we'll see that this morning in two points. We're going to see, first of all, the danger of forgetting, and then the drama behind the demands. So first of all, the danger of forgetting. You can see that this is the major point of this section if you just pay attention to the structure. I tried to give us a flavor of that this morning by starting in verse 4, but notice how in verses 1 to 9, Moses is basically calling for wholehearted devotion to the Lord. He's basically saying there, be careful to do what God has commanded. And then if you drop your eyes down to verses 20 to 25, you can see that Moses says much the same thing. It will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God. So verses 1 to 9 and verses 20 to 25 make the same point, but... Sandwiched then between those two sections, you have the center of the chapter, verses 10 to 19. And there you have God speaking to the people through Moses, essentially telling the people not to forget who they are and whose they are, to use churchy language. He's saying, do not forget the story of your redemption. Don't forget that you are a people who are not your own. You have been bought with a price. And the reason God reiterates that truth throughout the book of Deuteronomy uh, multiple times is because, first of all, because he loves his people. He wants them to know that they belong to him. Secondly, I think we can say he, he reiterates this because he knows uh, that our good intentions go bad fairly quickly. Uh, we, in the heat of the moment, we might say, may, may resolve to obey God, to do a better job, but we know as time wears on that uh, the intensity of those feelings goes away. And so God tells his people that he loves them. He actually tells them then in advance the struggles they are going to face as they seek to walk by faith in a fallen world. And so in verses 10 to 19, we see three dangers in particular that the people of Israel and that we here today need to pay attention to. First of all, in verses 10 to 12, we see the danger of affluence, the danger of affluence. Moses tells the people something we probably all know from our own common experience, and that is that it is never easier to forget God than when he has richly blessed us. I won't read all of verses 10 to 12 again, but just notice the end of verse 11. I tried to draw attention to it as I read the text. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord. He says, when you are full, you must be on guard. Why? Because material affluence, the blessings of this world, have a way of leading to what Paul Tripp calls gospel amnesia. We forget all that the Lord has done for us. Why is that the case? Why does that happen when we are blessed materially? Well, I think it's because it anesthetizes us to our need. We simply just don't feel as dependent on God as we really are. So Christopher Wright, one commentator, put it memorably. He said, the danger of fullness is that it can lead to forgetfulness. And the reason why that is so dangerous is because basically what we're forgetting is the story of God's faithfulness. But, as we'll see in just a moment, when we, when we forget the Lord's faithfulness, we replace that story with something else. 
we'll always be telling ourselves some kind of story. And so if we forget the Lord's faithfulness, we're going to replace that with an anti-gospel narrative. And it's the anti-gospel narrative that the children of Adam seem to run to uh, most uh, reflexively. That is, that we are our own saviors. That we did it ourselves. Just consider your own life. If we have good health, we tend to immediately credit our diet and exercise. That we were just wise enough. We're, we're kind of a cut above the rest because we were able to discipline ourselves. If we have a strong marriage or healthy relationships, um, we, we credit our emotional intelligence. It's a phrase that gets thrown around a lot today. If our children are well-behaved and their grades are exceptional, we credit our parenting skills. If we consider our past life and we, we see that really our lives haven't been marked by any kind of egregious sin, we tend to think it's, it's our own moral superiority. We have moral clarity that others don't have. If our finances are in order, then we credit our hard work and planning. All that to say, the reflex of fallen humanity is to credit ourselves. I like the way theologian Timothy George put it. He said, the posture of fallen reason is one of egocentricity. We're naturally caved in on ourselves. So that's what we think of ourselves. But what does God say about us? We don't have to wonder. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 4, 7 asks this question, of course, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? In other words, why do you boast as if it's not a gift? Here are some thoughts that went through my mind this week. Do you ever just marvel at your own existence? That when you get up in the morning, you can see, hear, taste, touch, smell. Why does anything work at all? You're not the one keeping yourself alive. You're not the one who keeps your heart beating. So, be on alert, Moses says to the people of Israel. Be on guard against the danger of material affluence. Don't repay, or excuse me, don't replace the story of God's faithfulness with the anti-gospel narrative of self-salvation. Why? Because when we forget God, we fill the void with false gods. That's what we see in the next section here, verses 13 to 15. There's a progression. Fullness leads to forgetfulness, and forgetfulness quickly slides into idolatry. Just look at verse 13. It is the Lord, your God, you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. Again, if you're familiar at all with the Old Testament, you know that Israel was surrounded by nations that worshipped false gods. And so Israel was constantly tempted to worship those false gods or to worship the true God in ways other than he had commanded. And so as Israel's getting ready to go into the promised land, Moses is telling them there are nations currently residing in that land. And there is the potential for you to slide into idolatry. And so he's saying the temptation to slide into idolatry and to embrace, embrace false gods will lead to you also embracing the quote-unquote stories of those false gods, right? They have their own messages of salvation. And so Moses is telling them, listen, you need to know now that those false gods are not the ones that delivered you. And so if you embrace them, you will have embraced a lie and that will result in enslavement, not liberation. Furthermore, he's saying to them, God has claimed you as his own. You're his people. And he is jealous, meaning he's not satisfied with half-hearted devotion. God wants all of you. That's why he said to love him with all of your heart, soul, and might. Very interesting Hebrew word. It's love me with all of your very muchness. In other words, go over the top in demonstrating your love for me. You are not your own, he said. You've been bought with a price. So that's the story we must preach to ourselves on a daily basis. Now, the comeback here might be, well, you know, Joe, we're not living in the ancient Near East with all those false gods. And so surely we don't have that same temptation. Well, it's true, we might not be worshiping the false gods in the ancient Near East, but we shouldn't act as if our own culture doesn't proclaim its own stories. 
And in particular, I think Tim Keller has been really helpful here. He's identified three rival narratives or alternative stories that are currently on offer in the culture we live in. So let's consider these alternative stories that our culture tells us. You've, maybe you wouldn't use this language, but you've probably heard them before. First of all, there's, uh, this is my language actually, there's what's called the narrative of authenticity. That's essentially the story that you just have to be true to yourself. Right? When it's all said and done, no one can tell you who you are. In fact, in the current cultural moment, we have to say, not even does your body, your physical body, tell you who you are. You, you just decide. And there are surgeries you can go through that will make reality adapt to you. You just have to be yourself. Why? Because to do anything else is to be inauthentic. So live your truth, we're told. Of course, sadly, even some professing evangelicals follow into this line of thinking. They say, God made me, therefore he made my desires. And since everything God made is good, those desires are good and they should be fulfilled. Of course, the Bible actually says that not all of your desires are good and not all of your desires come from God. In fact, it's possible to desire good things in the wrong way. And so in contrast to that, the biblical story calls us to embrace our created and dependent status. That our bodies are good. That gender is pre-fall. And so women are to embrace their femininity. Men are to embrace their masculinity. We offer up our bodies and our lives to God. But that's the narrative of authenticity. Then there's also the narrative of exclusive humanism. That language comes from philosopher Charles Taylor. Exclusive humanism means essentially that all that exists is the material world. There is no transcendent reality. There's no transcendent good. And so therefore, uh, what this amounts to is you just have to be happy. Of course, it's tied to the previous narrative we, we just heard that because to do anything else would be inauthentic. And so you need to pursue your happiness. That's the goal of life. And it would be wrong to sacrifice your definition of the happy life to anyone else. And so therefore, if that means aborting a child, then that's what you have to do. If that means walking out on your husband and wife and children because you've found your quote-unquote soulmate, then that's just what you have to do. Why? Because to do anything else would be inauthentic. You wouldn't be true to yourself. So... You have the narrative of authenticity and the narrative of exclusive humanism. Then you have what's called the narrative of reason and rationality. Keller defines this narrative like this. He says, this is the narrative that, quote, science is the only arbiter of what is real and factual and that we should not believe anything unless we can prove it decisively using empirical investigation. You know that that's a powerful and popular narrative. It seems so respectable. Without going into all the details, Keller at least points out that that narrative fails for a number of reasons, the first of which is that it doesn't meet its own demand. That is to say, the narrative itself is not subject to empirical investigation. The scientific method is a wonderful method, but if we're not to believe anything unless we can prove it decisively under empirical investigation, then don't we need a scientific method to prove the scientific method, and the scientific method to prove the scientific method, and so on and so forth. The point he's trying to make there is that that position is not a scientific conclusion. It is a philosophical assumption. Beyond that, of course, the narrative of reason and rationality doesn't have the moral resources necessary to serve as a foundation for human rights and human dignity. If I can just plug a book here, you may want to read Stephen D. Smith's book, The Disenchantment of Secular Discourse. The Disenchantment of Secular Discourse. Stephen D. Smith is not a Christian, but he points out in his book that we need to stop throwing around these terms, human dignity and human rights, because they mean nothing in and of themselves. They mean nothing unless you have a moral framework in order that can provide a basis for human dignity and human rights. See if you can follow along here. One of my favorite theologians, Herman Bovink, said, you can't have morals without metaphysics. In other words, you can't have an ethical, you can't make an ethical claim unless you can ground it in some kind of transcendent reality. So you have the narrative of authenticity, the narrative of exclusive humanism, and the narrative of reason and rationality. Those are all, those are three rival narratives to the biblical drama, to the biblical story of creation, fall, redemption, and consummation, where God lavishes his grace upon sinners in Christ. But if we fail to remember the story of God's faithfulness, then we need to know we will search for another story. 
that will capture our imagination and control our lives. And that brings us to the third danger that can potentially contribute to our forgetting God, and that is the danger of afflictions. Again, just look at verse 16. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you did, as you tested him at Massa. Now, we actually covered this story in some, at some length when we looked at Hebrews chapter 3, but just to remind us of what's going on here, at this point, God has already rescued his people from Egyptian slavery. They've seen a tremendous miracle, the Exodus. And yet, as they're traveling in the wilderness, they, they have a crisis, and that crisis is that they run out of clean drinking water. And so rather than trusting God, the one who's just miraculously freed them, they say, is the Lord among us or not? Does God even care? So we need to know, church, that afflictions, trials, tragedies, disappointments, whatever word, phrase you want to use, it is during the low points in your life that Satan is going to tempt you to rewrite the story of God's faithfulness. He's going to tempt you to believe that, whereas the the reality is that, that your interaction with God is marked by faithfulness and deliverance, Satan's going to tempt you to believe that it's really nothing more than an interaction of unfaithfulness and destitution that the Lord doesn't come through. We're all guilty of this to some degree. You ever find yourself just rehearsing all of the things you don't have? Now, I want to be clear here. It is appropriate to talk to God about your sadness and disappointment. That's absolutely true. There's a whole book of the Bible called Lamentations. So it's proper to lament. But I think we do need to be on our guard here and know that Satan is going to seek to exploit that and turn what I'm going to call here an appropriate lamentation, into an inappropriate accusation. You begin to accuse God. We need to hear this once again. Satan's goal is to destroy your trust relationship with God. And the way he's going to do that is by trying to undermine your confidence in God's character. And one of the things he wants you to believe is that God is really stingy. Uh, He's close-fisted. He's not generous. Here's an example. Remember the question that Satan asked Eve in the garden? Did God really say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Answer, no. That's not what God said. What God actually said was, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, except one. But Satan always emphasizes God's prohibitions rather than God's gracious provision. That's what he always does. And so Moses is warning the people there, know that in advance, don't repeat the same sin. And of course, that applies to all of us. We need to know that it's in our afflictions. When they enter our lives, Satan is going to exploit those occasions and he's going to tempt you to test God. Okay? He's going to tempt you to test God. Look at verse 16 again. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That verse should sound familiar to us because that's the verse Jesus quoted when Satan tempted him to test God. Remember, Satan comes to Jesus and says, paraphrasing here, throw yourself off the temple. After all, hasn't God promised that his angels will protect you? A misquotation of Psalm 91. That's the essence of Satan's temptation. Satan is going to tempt you to believe that if God really loved you, he would let you set the terms for how he loves you. You need to know that. Satan's going to tempt you to believe that if God really loved you, he would let you set the terms for how he loves you. In other words, Satan wants people to believe this. If God is love, and if God is really loving, then he would be open and affirming. This is deep, deep in the human heart. He's going to lead you to believe that if God really loved you, then he would love you in a way that is painless. We might not put it this bluntly, but Satan would have you believe that God doesn't love you unless he requires nothing of you. That Satan doesn't really, excuse me, that God doesn't really love you unless he doesn't ask you to repent. That if God was really love and he really loved you, uh, then you wouldn't have to change anything about yourself. Uh, If God really loved you, there would be no cost to following him. 
You understand that? I think we need to hear that again. I don't have many original thoughts, church. Okay, I'll be honest. I don't have many original thoughts. But that, that's the way it came to me. That Satan wants you to believe that if God really loved you, he would let you set the terms for how he loves you. What we need to do is remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's Trinity Sunday, so ponder this thought for just a minute. What we have is Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal word of God, relying on the written word of God. In other words, Jesus remembered the story. We need God's grace to withstand Satan's onslaughts. That means then the danger of affluence, the danger of alternative stories, all of which amount to God should conform to our demands and let us set the terms for how we relate to him. And then there's the danger of afflictions. Next, we see in verses 20 to 25, the drama behind the demands. What we have here is this. A child, a son, it says here, comes to his father and basically says, Dad, why do we do what we do? And what should stand out to us there is that the son asks a question about the law. But the father doesn't respond just by saying, we do what we do because God said so. Now, he does eventually get to that in verses 24 and 25, but he answers a question about the law with a story. And look at the components of the story. It's a story of slavery, rescue, deliverance, judgment, and restoration. And he says that compels us to live lives of obedience and gratitude. That's why when verse 25 says, it will be righteousness for us if we're careful to do this commandment before the Lord our God, righteousness there is not about meriting God's favor because the entire context excludes that. It's an entire story of God's initiative in salvation and him delivering the people by grace. And so righteousness there means this is the only fitting response. In light of how God has rescued us, the only appropriate right response would be to live a life of obedience, to say our lives are not our own. But let's make two quick points of application here. What we see is that obedience prompts questions. In other words, the, the, the children would not be asking their parents, why do we do what we do if the parents weren't obeying? Now, it doesn't mean it only applies to parents. For all of us, our obedience, how we live our lives, prompts questions from our friends and neighbors and other family members. Why do you do what you do? Why do you go to church on Sunday? Why do you read the Bible? Why do you pray? Why do you give a portion of your income to the church or other Christian organizations? Why would you give up your vacation to go on a mission trip? Why would you give up a lucrative career to serve in ministry? Why would you do any of that? Our obedience prompts questions. But notice what else we see here. We see here that we are to see ourselves in the story. You should see yourself in the story. Look at verses 20 to 21 again. Your son asks, Dad, why do we do what we do? What's the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes? It's about the law. He says in verse 21, You shall say to your son, We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out. He brought us out with a mighty hand. But here's what's astonishing. The generation of people that Moses commands to respond this way eventually would be people who were not Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt who did not see with their own eyes God miraculously deliver the people. But yet he says, you're to respond by saying, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. He's saying, see yourself in the story. You're not a spectator. You're a participant. During our Good Friday service, we had on our bulletin Rembrandt's painting known as the Raising of the Cross. And I pointed out that what's significant about that painting is that Rembrandt paints himself in the story. If you can see him there, that would be him right there. <laughs> he paints himself in the story because it's his way of saying, even though I wasn't physically present to crucify Jesus in the way I was. That's my story as well. That's why so many of us love that old Negro spiritual. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Sometimes it causes me to tremble. Why does any of that make a difference? Why do we need to know that? Because God's standards only make sense in light of the story. Remember those alternative stories we looked at earlier. Why, why do we reject those anti-gospel stories of authenticity and exclusive humanism and so forth? Why? Because 
Paul tells us, you are not your own. Therefore, glorify God in your body. But why does that make any difference? Because as he said earlier, you were bought with a price. In other words, the reason we don't live for ourselves is because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's why. When Jesus says, take up your cross, a symbol of death, take up your cross and follow me, that doesn't sound all that appealing. Why would anybody do that? You would only do that because of the death and resurrection of Christ. He's saying it's because of the story. That's why. So what that means for us, church, is that we're not called to live out of our own small stories. What small stories? How about this? The small story of your past failures. You are not what you have done. You're not a slave to your past. That's not just psychobabble. That's true. Why? Because Jesus got out of, out of the grave on the third day. That's why. That's why you're not a slave to your past. You're not defined by the small story of your past accomplishments either. Your past failures don't define you, but neither, by the way, do your past successes. Salvation is totally of grace. So you don't live in the small story of your resentment or your victimhood. We're also not called to live out of the 24-hour news cycle. We're not called to live out of the small story of some political party's depiction of the national narrative that's really nothing more than competing for temporal earthly power. Why? Because those are all too small. Our story is about the God who inhabits eternity, who dwells in unapproachable light, lives in joy, and that God aims to share the joy of his triune life with rebellious sinners. Isn't that amazing? Jesus took on human flesh. He lived for us. He died for us. He rose again from the dead and he claimed us as his own. In other words, he brought us out to bring us in. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. So the God who redeems calls us to remember. That's what I want us to see. Remember who you were. And remember what Christ did for you. Here's the question I want to ask us, church. How can you remember what God has done for you? Now, as soon as I ask that question, I want you to know, in some sense, you don't have to come up with it. Because God has actually already told us how we're to do that, to remember what he's done for us. That's through the signs of the covenant, baptism and the Lord's Supper. So in one sense, we don't, we don't carry the burden of having to remember what God has done for us. But in addition to that, I just want to ask, how can you maybe practically go about remembering what God has done for you? I'm just going to tell you one way I've done that, and um, you can use your imagination to do, <laughs> find this on your own. I have to, uh, it goes back to Rembrandt again, this, this artist I already pointed to once. Some of you know, if you go into my office there, right in off to the left, there's the, the painting, not the original one, just want to make clear, but, uh, but uh, Rembrandt's painting, uh, The Return of the Prodigal Son. And uh, I, have that, I have that plastered in front of my face wherever I go because that's my story. Uh, that's how I remember who I am. No matter all the ways that, that God has blessed me and he has in many, many ways, uh, the truth of the matter is because of, because of my past that doesn't define me, um, I know that that's who I am. Uh, one art historian described this this. This painting, he said, this is a painting of Jesus' famous parable in which the son who had spent his inheritance on wild living returns, kneeling before his father. He has, notice this in the painting, I don't know if you can see it there. Yeah, you can. He has on only one shoe. His clothes are bleached and tattered and worn. He is filthy. His father and brother, by contrast, are standing over him and they're dressed in finery. He says, it's clear that the prodigal son is a wretched specimen of human degradation and loss with nothing to commend himself to his father. And yet, this art historian says, yet Rembrandt, following Jesus' parable, pictures the father, nevertheless, bending over his son, heedless of his filth, unconcerned about the difference in their stations, holding his son close. 
The son's eyes are closed as he nestles his head on his father's breast. It's an amazing painting, but more than that, it is a powerful depiction of repentance. And I love these words. The wayward son has come home. He's on his knees and he's embraced in love. That's the story of us all. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you for your outrageous love for us, this outrageous grace that you've bestowed upon us. Lord, we know that we can't thank you enough, and we know that um, our present and future obedience does not pay off our past sins because there is nothing we can do. We are people in need of your grace. So, Lord, remind us to inhabit the story of your faithfulness, that you are a God who comes after your people. So may we offer up our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen.